Before we start today's video, we want to bring you word from our sponsor, Established Titles. Recently, I was bestowed with the title of Lord Criminally Listed. It's completely changed my life. When I walk into my local bar and grill, I announce, Lord Criminally Listed has arrived. Or when I show up at the dinner table, I tell my family, Lord Criminally Listed will be served now. Okay, so I'm joking about announcing my arrival and demanding to be served at the dinner table. But I was recently given the title of Lord by our wonderful sponsor, Established Titles. Established Titles is an awesome project based on the historic Scottish custom where landowners are called lairds, or lords and ladies in English. Established Titles allow people to buy at least one square foot of dedicated land so they can call themselves Lord or Lady. Plus, your purchase also helps the planet because they are committed to planting a tree with every order. They work with the organizations One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. What you get is a beautiful official certificate with a crest for your ownership of one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Elliston, Scotland. This is a great, unique gift that you give to anyone, and they also have couple packages so you can get adjoining plots of land for you and that special someone. One of the coolest parts about this gift, you can change your title on things like credit cards and plane tickets to Lord or Lady. Not to mention how great the title would look on a dating profile. One aspect that I think is really cool is that established titles told me that the first 200 people to purchase a title package will be placed next to mine or around it, so we'll all be within a few minutes walking of each other. If enough of us want to be lords or ladies, we can essentially make our little channel a kingdom. Established Titles is actually running a big sale right now. Plus, if you use the code criminally listed, you get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash criminally listed to get your gifts now and help support the channel. Number 3. Thomas Rendell In early 1969, 19-year-old Theodore John Conrad got a job at Society National Bank Headquarters in Cleveland, Ohio. Conrad told several friends that the bank had lacked security and he could easily rob it. None of his friends thought he was serious. Conrad was also obsessed with the movie The Thomas Crown Affair. In the film, Thomas Crown, played by Steve McQueen, masterminds a bank robbery because he's bored and to prove to himself that he can do it. At the end of the day on Friday, July 11th, 1969, the day after Conrad's 20th birthday, he walked into the vault at the bank. He packed $215,000 worth about $1.7 million in 2022 into paper bags and walked out of the bank. On Monday, the employees of the bank realized that the money was gone. The authorities were alerted. But Theodore Conrad was gone, and he had a two-day head start. The case was assigned to a deputy U.S. Marshal named John Elliott. John interviewed Conrad's girlfriend. He had sent her several letters after he robbed the bank. His letters indicated they stopped in Los Angeles, California and Washington, D.C., but he didn't say where he ended up. Conrad also thought he could return to Cleveland after seven years because the statute of limitations would have expired. But the problem was that he was indicted, so the statute of limitations no longer applied. U.S. Marshal John Elliott worked on the case for several decades. Theodore Conrad cut off all ties from his three siblings and divorced parents. He also didn't commit any other crimes. But even if he did, he could have continued to live in secrecy because the marshals didn't have his fingerprints on file. In the 1990s, John Elliott retired. But he continued to come into the office and look over files, hoping to see something that would crack the case. In the early 2000s, John's son, U.S. Marshal Peter Elliott, took over the case. In March 2020, John Elliott died without finding out what happened to Theodore Conrad. Then, sometime in 2021, Peter Elliott came across the obituary of a man named Thomas Rendell, who lived in Linfield, a suburb of Boston, Massachusetts. It was never made clear how Peter came across the obituary. 
Peter knows some similarities between Thomas's and Conrad's lives. They both have the same birth dates, except that Thomas's birth year was two years before Conrad's birth year. Thomas's parents' names were also very similar to Conrad's parents' names. Thomas also had the same alma mater as Conrad and the same birth city. Peter Elliott continued to investigate Thomas Rendell and found more evidence that he was Theodore Conrad. Peter managed to get Thomas Rendell's signature and compared it to Theodore Conrad's signature. He thought that they were very similar. Peter also learned that there was no record of Thomas Rendell before January 1970. That's when he applied for a social security number in Boston, which is where he settled. Peter didn't think it was a coincidence that Conrad chose the name Thomas and moved to Boston because of his love of the Thomas Crown Affair. The main character's name is Thomas, and the movie takes place in Boston. Shortly after arriving in Boston, Thomas got a job as an assistant golf pro at a country club outside of Boston. He gave golf lessons to the members. At some point, he became manager of the country club. Thomas Rendell met a woman named Kathy, and they were married in 1982. She gave birth to a daughter named Ashley. Thomas eventually changed careers and started selling luxury cars. He did that for 40 years and he was mostly successful. Thomas played golf throughout his life. He was known for never bending the rules and he never took side bets. He was excellent at golfing. At one charity event, he beat Hall of Famer golfer Johnny Miller. Thomas spent several winters in Florida playing golf. Thomas was also a good cook who enjoyed watching cooking shows on television. He also liked the crime drama NCIS. In 2014, Thomas and Kathy filed for bankruptcy protection. They had $160,000 in credit card debt and not many assets. Many people who knew Thomas Rendell said he was the nicest guy you could ever meet. He had friends who were police officers and even one who was an FBI agent. Peter Elliott talked to Thomas Rendell's family. They said that his wife had invited his friends over to say goodbye just before he died of lung cancer. On his deathbed, Thomas confessed that he was really Theodore Conrad and he had robbed the Society National Bank headquarters in 1969. U.S. Peter Elliott closed the case his father couldn't 52 years after the crime was committed. Peter said that none of Thomas's family would be charged for not informing the authorities that he confessed on his deathbed. The Eric Conrad's surviving family were informed that he had been found. They had assumed he died a long time ago. His sister thought she would die without finding out whatever happened to him. She said she was relieved to learn that he had lived a happy life. Number 2. Sharon Diane Crawford Smith Staunton is a small city in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. In 1967, it had a population of about 25,000 people. In April 1967, 19-year-old Constance Havener and her 20-year-old sister-in-law, Caroline Perry, were working at an ice cream shop in the city called High's Ice Cream. Havener was married to Perry's brother. Both women were well-liked and didn't appear to have any enemies. On the night of April 11, 1967, the sisters-in-law were working in the shop. Just before closing, a customer came into the store. It was open, but they couldn't find anyone working. The customer went into the back room and found the two young women lying in pools of blood. The customer called for help. 19-year-old Constance Havener died on the way to the hospital. 20-year-old Caroline Perry arrived at the hospital but died a few hours later. Both had been shot in the head with a 25 caliber gun. $138 had been stolen. 
The police weren't entirely convinced that the women were killed because the robbery went wrong. It didn't appear that the women put up much of a fight, so the robber could have easily taken the money and gone away. The police also didn't think $138 was worth killing two young women. The chief of detectives, Davy Bocock, interviewed several people who were near the ice cream shop around the time of the shooting. They remember seeing a man using a payphone near the scene of the shooting. A 23-year-old unemployed school teacher named William Thomas Jr. contacted the police and said he was the person they were looking for. Thomas claimed he saw two men running away from the scene. He also later said he saw a dog who had a pair of bloody pants. Detective Bocock thought that some of Thomas' stories were unusual. Thomas then admitted they made up some of his stories. He was given a polygraph exam. The examiner thought that Thomas enjoyed lying and he thought that he could beat a polygraph machine. The police concluded that the only reason Thomas would lie was because he was the killer. In October 1967, six months after the murders, Thomas was indicted on two counts of murder. But the district attorney decided to only try him for the murder of Constance Sevener. This was done in case he was acquitted, that he could be tried for the murder of Caroline Perry. William Thomas went to trial for Hevener's murder in April 1968. The police had turned up more evidence on Thomas. They found a witness who was in the ice cream shop at 10.20 p.m., which is about 15 minutes before the women were found shot. The witness said she saw a man in the shop that she thought was Thomas. The police also discovered that Thomas was $700 in debt which contributed to his motive. But a police sketch artist testified and said that the witness couldn't describe the man in the shop well enough to draw a sketch. The defense had Thomas's wife and her friend testify. They both said that Thomas was with them around the time of the murder. Thomas's father also testified. He said he wasn't a wealthy man, but he did have money and investments. His son knew if he was desperate enough for money, he could come to him. After a four-day trial, the jury deliberated for two and a half hours. They found William Thomas not guilty of murder. Although Thomas wasn't tried for the murder of Perry in case he was acquitted of killing Hebner, the district attorney chose not to take him to court again. Instead, he remained the prime suspect and the indictment was held over his head. In 1980, Davy Bocock was removed from active duty. The city manager assigned him to auxiliary service. In 2006, Davy Bocock died at the age of 76. In summer 2008, 41 years after the murders, the police caught a break in the case. A woman named Joyce Bradshaw contacted the police. She said that in 1967, she worked with a woman named Sharon Diane Crawford Smith. Smith had a second job. She worked at High's Ice Cream with Constance Hevener and Caroline Perry. Bradshaw told the police that she went for dinner with Smith about a week before the shooting. Bradshaw said that Smith showed her a gun and said she had two bullets. One was for her stepfather, who had supposedly sexually abused her, and another was for that Havener girl. After the shooting, Bradshaw said she told Detective Davy Bocock what Smith had said. A few days later, Bocock told her that Smith was cleared as a suspect. He said she had taken a polygraph exam and passed. Also, Smith had a gun and ballistic testing was done. Bocock told her that the bullets weren't fired from Smith's gun. Bocock then said something that Bradshaw interpreted as a threat. He told her that Smith was a good shot. So Bradshaw decided not to go back and talk to another detective. But deep in her heart, Bradshaw always knew 
that Smith was the killer. In November 2008, the police went to interview Smith. After the murder, she moved away from Staunton. She got married and had two daughters. Smith eventually moved back to Staunton. She left her husband and she moved in with a woman whom she was in a romantic relationship with. When the police interviewed Smith, she was in a terminal care center. She was dying from heart and kidney problems. She told the investigators that she went to the ice cream shop on the night of the murders to tell them that she couldn't work the next day. She didn't explain why, but she brought her gun with her. She said that Heavener and Perry started making fun of her for being gay and they called her a lesbian. Smith said that she started fighting with Hebner. She then pulled out the gun and shot both women. She sold the money to make it look like a robbery. Smith said that sometime after the murders, she gave the gun to someone who got rid of it for her. That person was Detective Davy Bocock. The police learned that Smith and Bocock had a personal relationship. Bocock taught her how to shoot a gun on his farm. The police investigated Smith's confession and confirmed many aspects of it. The police couldn't confirm if Bocock disposed of the weapon, but they pointed out that Smith was truthful about other things in her deathbed confession. On December 12th, Smith was charged with two counts of first degree murder. On December 30th, the indictment against William Thomas Jr. was dropped after 41 years. Sharon Diane Crawford Smith died on January 19, 2009 at the age of 60. Four days later, the police went public with Smith's deathbed confession and they said they were confident she was the killer. However, they still do not know how Davy Bocock was involved in the aftermath of the murders or what he knew. Nearly two years later, William Thomas Jr. filed a lawsuit against the Sun Police Department for $200 million. He claimed that Bocock knew from day one who killed Constance Hevener and Caroline Perry. He then helped Smith cover it up. That cover-up led to Bocock framing him for the murders. Thomas also alleged that Bocock and Smith had a sexual relationship. He claimed that Bocock fathered either one or both of Smith's daughters. The district attorney's office and the police department asked Smith's daughters for a sample of their DNA, but they refused to give a sample. William Thomas's case was ultimately dismissed because the statute of limitations had run out. Number 1. Amy Billig Amy Billick was born in January 1957 in Manhattan, New York. Her parents, Ned and Susan, considered her their miracle child. Ned was a trumpet player who performed in Greenwich nightclubs. He met Susan, who was a singer, at a gig. Amy was born 10 years into their marriage. The couple had previously suffered five miscarriages. A year after Amy was born, Susan gave birth to a son named Josh. In 1968, Susan visited Coconut Grove, Florida, and she fell in love with the Miami neighborhood. The family decided to move there to escape New York's crime. In Coconut Grove, Ned opened a popular art gallery, and Susan was an interior designer. Amy was considered a flower child. She wrote and read poetry. She inherited her parents' musical talent as well. She played the guitar and classical flute. She loved animals and she was a vegetarian. She volunteered at a nonprofit group that transitioned dolphins that were in captivity into the wild. Amy would play music for the dolphins and she was sure that the dolphins heard the music and responded to it. On March 5, 1974, 17-year-old Amy planned on meeting some friends for lunch at the Village Center. 
But Amy had a problem. She didn't have any money on her. She called her father at his art gallery and he agreed to give her some money if she came by. The art gallery was a short distance from the village center. Amy walked a block to the main highway and stuck out her thumb, hoping to catch a ride. It was common for Amy to hitchhike in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, Amy never made it to her father's office. She also didn't make it home that evening, so she was reported missing. Days passed and several tips came in, but they did not lead to Amy being found. One person saw her get into a green Jeep. Another person said he saw her get into a white van. On March 16, 1994, 11 days after Amy vanished, her family received a call. It was from a woman who refused to give her name. She said that some members of the outlaw motorcycle gang kidnapped Amy while she was hitchhiking. They had taken her to Daytona Beach, Florida, and they were holding her against her will. It turned out that on the day Amy went missing, chapters of the outlaw and pagan motorcycle gangs passed through Coconut Grove on their way to Bike Week in Daytona Beach, Florida. Not long after that call, the police got another lead. A man had found Amy's camera on an off-ramp to Florida's Turnpike in Wildwood, Florida. Wildwood is about 280 miles north of Coconut Grove. He knew it was Amy's camera because her name was printed on it. The location where the camera was found was interesting because if bikers were traveling north from Daytona towards any of the interior states, they would have passed through Wildwood. But there were several problems. The first was that the camera was found on the southbound turnpike. If Amy had been kidnapped by bikers heading from Coconut Grove to Daytona Beach, the camera probably would have been found on the northbound turnpike. Secondly, Amy's family couldn't remember the last time they saw the camera, so they weren't sure if she had it on her when she went missing. The film in the camera was developed and most of the photos were overexposed. The police and Amy's family did not think that any of the visible photos were clues to her disappearance. Then, on March 22, 1974, nearly two weeks after Amy went missing, Susan received another phone call. It was a man who said they were holding Amy captive. They would release her in exchange for $30,000. The family gathered the money. The next morning, Susan went to hand off the money at a hotel. She was surprised that the person who came to accept the money was a teenage boy. Susan refused to hand over the money without him proving he had Amy. The boy couldn't, so Susan kept the money and the boy ran away. Police officers were monitoring the situation. They arrested the boy and his twin brother, who was also at the hotel. They were identified as Larry and Charles Glasser, who were both 16. They had never met Amy, and they weren't involved in her kidnapping. The brothers were charged with extortion. They pleaded guilty, and they were put under house arrest. As the weeks passed, Amy's family continued receiving tips that the motorcycle gang was holding her. Specifically, she was being held by a member of the outlaws in an apartment just outside of Orlando in Kissimmee. A detective talked to a convenience store clerk close to the apartment. She remembers seeing a girl who looked like Amy. Susan decided to travel to Kissimmee herself to talk to the clerk. The clerk said that the girl would come in every Sunday and buy vegetable soup. Susan thought that this was promising because Amy was a vegetarian. The last time she saw her was about a week earlier. Susan and the detective went to the apartment where the girl had supposedly stayed. Whoever had lived there had cleared out quickly and left many things behind. 
Susan found a hairbrush with some hair on it, and there were some other items as well. The detective collected them for evidence. The hairs were compared to Amy's hair, and they were similar. Susan then asked the police to get Amy's fingerprints from her bedroom. Unfortunately, because of the weather in Florida, the fingerprints in the bedroom had degraded. So a technician could not find a viable single fingerprint in her bedroom. A year went by, and Bike Week was once again held at Daytona Beach. Amy's family roamed around looking for her, but they didn't find her. On the morning of November 30th, 1975, Susan received a call from a man who said he was in the motorcycle gang, the Pagans. He had recently gone out of prison. He said that he had owned Amy while he lived in Orlando. He had bought her from another biker named Brackett. The man agreed to meet with Susan. He brought Susan to his home and described Amy accurately. This included a scar she had, and that information had never been made public. The man said that he had known Amy before he went to prison. She didn't know who she was and didn't remember her name or her family. He said when he was arrested in July 1974, a few months after Amy went missing, he handed her off to another biker named Dishrag Harry. Susan would later learn that Dishrag Harry's real name was Harry Kramer. The man told Susan he would ask around about Amy. Susan memorized the license plate of the man's bike and after she was dropped off, she called the police. She learned that the man she spoke to was named Paul Branch. He had done time for auto theft, concealed weapons, assault, and murder. He had shot a guy in the head in a bar. He was released after seven years because his conviction was overturned on a technicality. Branch was apparently an executioner for the Pagans. He had been a Hell's Angel and formerly had Hell's Angels tattoos. But he burned them off with battery acid to avoid being killed by members of the Hell's Angels. Branch later told Susan he tracked Amy down to the West Coast. She was living with a man who didn't want to give her up. Branch said that he and a friend were heading to the area where the man and Amy lived and he would report back. But Branch never made it to the West Coast. When Susan asked him why he hadn't gone, he always had an excuse. Then Branch told Susan that Amy was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Susan traveled to Tulsa and began looking for her daughter. Branch came to Tulsa and claimed he was there looking for Amy. Susan ended up spending over a month in Tulsa. During her stay, she lost contact with Paul Branch. She left Tulsa without being any closer to finding her daughter. In December 1976, Susan tracked down Brackett, the biker Branch claimed he bought Amy from. Brackett was in prison in Florida. He denied selling any girl to Branch. Susan continued looking for her daughter by visiting places like strip clubs in Florida and asking if anyone recognized Amy. No one could say for sure that they saw her. In the summer of 1977, three years after Amy went missing, Paul Branch called Susan out of the blue. He said that Amy had been in Tulsa and that she was taken to Seattle, Washington. Not long after the call, Susan found out she had heart disease. She had a bypass operation and spent a week in intensive care. Even in the hospital, she spent her time investigating by making phone calls from her bedside. Then, in mid-November, Susan traveled to Seattle. Several people said that they saw Amy, but Susan had no definitive evidence that her daughter was ever there. She returned home after a few weeks. 
Another year went by, and no trace of Amy was found. In May 1979, a man calling himself Hal Johnson started calling Susan. He told her he saw her daughter and gave her an address. Turned out that the address didn't exist. Hal Johnson would later call back and say obscene things to Susan. He liked to tell her that he was keeping Amy as a sex slave or that she was part of a sex slave ring. Hal Johnson continued to call Susan for years. Every time the police traced the calls, they were traced to pay phones. The 1970s ended and the 1980s passed without any trace of Amy turning up. In spring 1992, Susan was diagnosed with lung cancer. She was only given a few months to live. One day, Hal Johnson called her and Susan told him that she was dying. She told him that if she really had information about her daughter, they could he please tell her. Instead, he continued to torment her. Susan had several operations and she survived her cancer diagnosis. But then in January 1993, Ned Billing was diagnosed with lung cancer. Hal Johnson kept calling Susan to harass her. He would mock her about her husband dying. In March 1993, 69-year-old Ned Billing passed away. On his deathbed, Susan promised that she would never stop looking for Amy. After Ned died, Hal Johnson called and laughed at Susan because she was all alone now. He told her that she better watch out. Eventually, a cold case detective was signed to Amy's case. He also traced Hal Johnson's calls. All that was known was that the calls were coming from payphones in Kendall, a suburb of Miami. The detective set up surveillance of the payphones, but it didn't lead to Hal Johnson's arrest. The cold case detective also found Paul Branch. He was living in Gordonsville, Virginia. Branch had spent much of the 1980s in prison for murder. He got out early because he snitched on other bikers. When the detective found Branch, he had skin cancer. Branch told the detective everything he told Susan was true. He had known Amy for a short time in Orlando and then gave her to a man named Dishrick Harry. In 1993, Hal Johnson called Susan again. This time, the call was traced to a cell phone. But at the time, due to technological limitations, the police couldn't trace it to a specific cell phone. But then, in October 1995, the police finally traced the cell phone. After 17 years, the caller was identified. It belonged to a 48-year-old man named Henry Johnson Blair who worked as a customs agent. At the time, he was the top supervisor of undercover operations. Henry was interrogated and he admitted that he made the calls. He blamed it on his obsessive compulsive disorder that he would get drunk and make the calls. He was adamant that he had never met Amy and had nothing to do with her disappearance. But there were some odd potential connections between Henry Blair and Amy. Henry married a woman named Cynthia shortly before Amy vanished. They returned from their honeymoon two days before she was kidnapped. Weeks after Amy vanished, a woman who identified herself as Mrs. Blair called Susan and said that her husband said that he saw Amy walking in North Miami. Also, just before she went missing, Amy had written in her journal about a man named Hank who wanted to take her to South America. None of Amy's friends knew anybody named Hank, but Henry Blair's nickname was Hank. When Amy went missing, Henry was a sky marshal who often traveled to South America. One of the photos found on Amy's camera was of a white van. 
1974, Henry owned a white van that was the same model as the van in the photo. Also, a witness said that they saw Amy getting into a white van, but the police never found any evidence connecting Henry to Amy's disappearance. Henry Blair was charged with aggravated stalking. He went to trial at the end of February 1996. He was ultimately found guilty of stalking, but not aggravated stalking. He was sentenced to two years in prison. Susan then sued Henry. He settled out of court for $5 million, but he didn't have that much money, so he was only ordered to pay between $6,000 and $7,500 every year. In early 1998, a British documentary team went to interview Paul Branch. But they were too late. His girlfriend told them he had died on New Year's Eve 1997. But she supposedly told the team that she had information about Amy's whereabouts. So the documentary team flew in Susan and she talked to the woman who was never identified. Paul Branch's girlfriend told Susan that Branch had made a deathbed confession. She said that Amy and another girl showed up at a pagan party on the night she went missing. Amy started drinking and doing drugs. At one point she got mouthy and one of the bikers decided they would gang rape her. During the assault, Amy was given drugs several times to ensure she wouldn't fight back. At some point, she overdosed and died. So they cut up her body and then dumped the remains in the Everglades so that the alligators could eat them. The police and Susan initially believed Paul Branch's girlfriend's story. In March 1998, Amy's family had a memorial service for her. The documentary team encouraged Susan to put Amy's death date as March 5th, 1974, the day she disappeared on her tombstone. But then, it was later revealed that Branch's girlfriend was paid for the interview. Most news services do not pay for interviews because it can influence people to say things that the producer wants them to say. So the death by confession is considered highly questionable. One of Paul's friends was questioned, and he was sure that Amy lived with him in Orlando. He said that afterward, she was sent north, possibly to New Jersey. She was probably murdered there at some point because she had witnessed too many crimes, and her case was highly publicized. Susan wrote a book about her search for her daughter called Without a Trace. Susan Billing died in June 2005 at the age of 70. Unfortunately, many questions were left unanswered by the time she died. What happened to her daughter and who is responsible for her disappearance? Was Paul Branch involved? If not, how do you know about her scar? Did he confess on his deathbed? Was Henry Blair responsible for Amy's disappearance? Or did he really not know Amy? If he did, how do you explain all the strange connections to him? Or were they just coincidences? Unfortunately, Susan never found out the answers to these questions. Her son and Amy's brother, Josh, continues to look for his sister. If Amy Billing is alive today, she'll be 65 years old. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.